right now I would like to introduce our next present presenters. Okay, we have Chris Best. I, if you don't know who Chris Best is, then I would be surprised because Chris, Chris is all over the state. Chris Best, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is a native of St. Louis, Missouri. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Plant Biochemistry from the University of Illinois in 1981 and a Master of Arts in Botany from Southern Illinois University in 1985. His thesis research on, on vesicular mycorrhizae and re revegetated strip mine spoil led to a career in restoration of ecology. From 1985 to 1989, he served as an agroforestry extensionist with the US Peace Corps and uh, in Guatemala. So that's probably how he got to know Spanish, eh? From, um, Chris has served since 2006 as the state botanist for US Fish and Wildlife Service in Austin, Texas, where he's dedicated to the conservation of rare, threatened and endangered plants and their habitats in Texas. He serves on the Monarch Conservation Team for the agency's Southwest region. Now, hold on, I have one more to, person to introduce. And that would be Dr. Carolyn, Carolyn Whiting. Carolyn just moved out to this area is working for uh, Big Bend National Park. And she's their botanist for the, for the service out there. Before moving to West Texas, she was a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin, working on rare plants in Big Bend, invasive grasses in Central Texas and fire ecology with Dr. Norma Fowler, our Austin chapter we have Dr. Norma Fowler in our Austin chapter, so we're very proud of that. She is originally from New Jersey and got her undergraduate degree from Smith College in Western Massachusetts. Carolyn is so excited to get to know the Trans-Pecos plants better, and she's always appreciative of any hot tips for what's in bloom. And we are excited to have her here. So please welcome Chris and Carolyn. Good morning. Um, my title as state botanist is doubly a euphemism. Um, for one thing, uh, the only reason I'm called the state botanist is that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service only employs one botanist in the state of Texas. <laughs> and also, um, I'm really not a, a floristic botanist like so many of the other presenters here. Um, Sorry, I wanted to get that going. Um, I, I really occupy the ecotone between the world of botany and the world of uh, government solicitors and policy wonks <laughs> and bureaucrats. So my job is a lot, has everything to do with the uh, listing and recovery of uh, threatened and endangered plant species. Now our talk today is about four federally listed plant species at Big Bend National Park. But we are going to focus on this one. Can you, do I, if I move the cursor, can you all see that? That, no, oh, too bad. Uh, he's gonna fix that. Hmm. Could we change it to just one screen? Okay. All right. So, hmm. So I don't quite get that. Uh, why can't I see the cursor there? Unless you want to like drag it out over here. This is beyond me. Never mind that. So. Um, Let's uh, moving on. Uh, uh, of the four species, I just want to briefly mention the first three. Uh, this is uh, the Chisos hedgehog cactus. Um, it is a threatened species, and you can see in the uh, on the left, there's a map, and that red oval represents the entire global range of this. Uh, subspecies. 
but you'll also see a kind of a Rorschach pattern of green, which was my attempt to model the potential range of this species. So um, a potential range would be everywhere we think the species might occur based on what we know about it. And in the case of this species, uh, I looked at the soil types, the underlying geology, the elevation ranges, and the, the slope. And those are things that we can model in a geographic information system on computers, and we can you know, uh, display where that would be in the world. And that's uh, useful for what Carolyn will be talking about. Um, now, I mentioned that this was a threatened species, so I want to, you know, referring back to the world of uh, government solicitors, the Endangered Species Act itself prescribes uh, what we can and can't do. And so the term endangered species means any species in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. <laughs> And uh, just exactly what the significant portion of a species range has been the topic of many lawsuits and court cases. So I said that Chiso's hedgehog was a threatened species. Well, threatened means it's likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. So from that we conclude not currently endangered, but it's headed in that direction and therefore it needs federal protection. Another threatened species at the park is the bunched quarry cactus. And uh, the red polygons that you see there represent uh, the known populations. And the green uh, polygons represent uh, a model of where we think it could occur. And it's always important to talk about that, especially in Texas, where uh, so about 95% of the land is privately owned and uh, we can access that land with landowner permission, but that's, you know, a small subset of all the land that's out there. And one more threatened species at the park is Lloyd's mariposa, um, which again, uh, in this picture, the known populations are the green uh, areas and the red represents its potential habitat. So I'm going to focus again on the Guadalupe fescue. Um, now I have the unusual distinction. Uh, I actually did the background work uh, for the listing of this species, which uh, published in September of 2017. And it was the first species listed under the prior presidential administration. And I think I was offered up, you know, kind of as a test case. It's like, send the botanist up first. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And, um, but nothing unusually bad happened to me. And so then they went ahead and listed other species. But uh, here you see the plant in the uh, photograph at the upper left. And to the upper right, you can see some of the identification features, uh, very specifically in picture two there, the red arrow points to the, the ligule, uh, which is uh, an appendage at, right at the base of the leaf blade where the leaf blade joins the uh, sheath of the leaf. So the scientific name Festuca ligulata refers specifically to that uh, extended ligule. And uh, in picture five, you see a, uh, uh, one of the survey crews led by the former park botanist, Joe Sorotnik. Um, now this species uh, in the US, it, many of you will recognize the photograph in picture four of Boot Canyon. And I'll refer to that again. But uh, the species was first uh, documented, first collected in Guadalupe uh, Mountains, which is now a national park, and that's where it got its name. But it has not been seen there since the 1950s. And uh, so Boot Canyon is the only remaining known U.S. population. There are four others in Mexico, 
and we are working with uh, Mexican agencies to conserve those populations. Now, again, referring to the Endangered Species Act, uh, the first list of plants to be considered for protection was spelled out in the act itself, section 12, basically authorized the Smithsonian Institution to come up with a list of plants that we should consider. Um, but subsequently, um, we have, a, you know, as a result of many years of um, policy adjustments and lawsuits and federal court cases, we have a, a very formalized process now where we do what a, a biologist or botanist such as myself will do a species status assessment. And um, it's a very uh, kind of formatted procedure to look at everything we know about a species and come up to a, reach a conclusion whether or not that this would need protection under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, a core part of the species status assessment is what we call the three R's. We, we need to consider resilience, which refers to population sizes and demographic trends. You know, how large are these populations and where are they headed? Redundancy refers to the number of populations. And representation refers to the breadth of uh, environmental adaptation and genetic diversity. Well, to talk about species viability, we must be able to measure population sizes. And we also have to be able to map their distribution in the world. So population sizes, that is really what our talk is getting about. Because if, if we can't measure population sizes, we really can't decide whether a species needs protection and we can't figure out, you know, where is it headed? Is it stable, improving? Is it deteriorating? What's going on? How can we conserve this species? So um, plant surveys or rare plant uh, studies typically begin with uh, some survey of some kind. And uh, quite often, uh, uh, the first surveys are what I call intuitive wander surveys, or some people call them meander surveys. But, um, you know, some plant wizard, some floristic botanist wanders around through a habitat, and they find something rare and unusual, and they take note of it, and then they may not even understand what, they're, what is really guiding them, but they look for more of that. And... Um, Sometimes this is a very efficient way to find these rare resources, but it also um, doesn't, you know, it may not be very representat representative of habitats, but it, it is a logical first step. And uh, for people who have that innate understanding of plant distribution, it, it can be very effective. After that, we start learning more about a plant and we develop this list of uh, characteristics of its habitat. And then we, for example, the potential habitat models that I referred to can guide us to do more surveys. So I would call those informed wander surveys. Uh, again, this can be an efficient way to find these plants, but it is a biased approach because uh, once we start finding a plant, then we continue to look for it in places that resemble where we found it before, but we may be missing some of the places where it occurs. Now there's a, let's say we now through our wander surveys, we've found a number of uh, populations or colonies or clusters of some plant of interest. And a, a type of study that's often been done um, which has different names, but they could be called permanent monitoring plots. And what would happen is someone would say, hey, I know where there is some of this bunched quarry cactus or this Jesus hedgehog. And I'm going to go out there and I'll put a stake in the ground as a, uh, um, a, a, a 
you know, right in the middle of this colony. And I'm going to measure with a tape measure the distance and a compass heading to each plant. And every plant that I find, I'm going to put a tag. And every year we go back and we determine, is that plant still alive? You know, you measure it and determine if it's flowering and did it make any uh, seeds or fruits. And this is, um, has been a, a, an effective way to gather information about species. We learn a lot about their growth rates, reproductive rates, recruitment, mortality, and lifespan. However, dot, 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 I would just hold on to that thought. So, you know, you have one of these monitoring plots over here. And then somebody says, look, here's another cluster, and we make another monitoring plot and another monitoring plot. So I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to work with park botanist Joe Sorotnik on a number of occasions. We came out to the park and assisted him in collecting data from monitoring plots for these species. And in uh, March of 2016, after we completed uh, the surveys for that year, uh, Joe observed that all of these four species, the monitoring plot data showed that the populations were declining and, and had declined fairly drastically. And so he had posed the question to me, what do you think this means? You know, should these threatened species be reclassified as endangered? And uh, based on my fairly limited understanding of statistics, my answer was, Joe, I don't know what this means. Now let's look specifically at the Guadalupe fescue. So um, here you see the Habitat Boot Canyon. Um, I'm gonna zoom in. You can see kind of a purplish uh, rectangle there and zooming in on that, that's an area of about 12 and a half acres. And beginning in 1993, um, the Texas Parks and Wildlife botanist, Jackie Poole, who many of you know, she's, you know, like the, um, almost the godmother of plant conservation in Texas. And she had found a number of clusters of Guadalupe fescue. And you can see that there were six plots that she established. And as far as we know, those are all the Guadalupe fescue that were known at that time. And you'll, you'll say, wait, I see seven plots. And actually what happened is they lost one of the plots for a few years and then they found it. So they made a, sub, a, a substitute and then they found it again later. So, but they're really only six plots. So um, those are the six plots and the, the graph you see below shows the population numbers and they go up and they go down and then um, after the droughts of 2011 and 2012, the population had declined from 127 to 47. So that was a pretty grim outlook. And here you see again, Joe with some of his volunteers uh, flagging plants. And, um, but in any case, um, Joe had mentioned to me, he said, you know, when, as we walk from plot to plot, we're, we are seeing more Guadalupe fescue outside the plots. So, um, and I know, I'm um, sure uh, any of you who knew Joe know that he sadly passed away in 20, 2019, 2019. Anyway, he, he had left the park in 2016. And um, in 2017, I went out with other park um, personnel and I, while, we, while some of the people were collecting plot data, I did my own meander survey and I found 225 additional plot plants that were outside the plot. So, you know, based on the, this comment that Joe had made, you know, hey, we do see plants outside the plots now. And so the red dots that you see there represent individuals or groups that I found at that time. And, um, the green, of course, are the original plots. So really, it looks like uh, actually 
even though the plot populations had declined, the plant was still, you know, there was enough recruitment going on that it looked like it was at least stable. It's just that the new recruitment had occurred outside the plots. And so basically what happened is in, in March of 2016, based on this discussion that Joe and I had, we decided let's get a formal study done. Let's get the right people in who understand statistics and plant sampling methods. And um, so uh, we talked to Texas Parks and Wildlife and convinced them to create a priority to, uh, for Section 6 funding. Section 6 actually comes from Fish and Wildlife Service. And these are grants that we give to the state agencies for the recovery of endangered species. And um, uh, Anna Strong at TPWD agreed with us and this, we made this a priority. And uh, the grant eventually went to uh, Dr. Norma Fowler at UT and Dr. Martin Terry here at Sol Ross. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, Fowler, uh, somehow convinced Carolyn Whiting, my colleague, to take on this project. And uh, she did such a good job with it that she's now, now Dr. Carolyn Whiting. Um, she is the botanist who follows uh, the wonderful lead of Joe Sorotnik. And I've been working with her for three years and uh, she's just a terrific logistic uh, planner and leader of people and a uh, very enjoyable uh, experience to work with. So please. Thanks, Chris. Um, so Chris made the funding happen and then was also instrumental in making the field work happen too. And I'm going to talk about the study that we did to assess the population size. So as a reminder, this is the, the grass. Chris has already talked to you about the ligule, and there it is. It's one of the features that we look for when we're trying to decide if we're looking at the right grass or not, that big ligule. Um, and this is the habitat. This is what it looks like um, when we got there in 2019 in the Boot Canyon area. You'll see that it's a mixed conifer woodland with pines and oaks. And although it is a fairly close canopy, there's enough sunlight coming through to support small grasses in the understory. And you can also see in this picture that there is a lot of dead fuel. There are whole trees on the ground, branches on the ground, dead branches in the canopy that haven't fallen down yet. And part of the reason for that is that it has been 80 years since the last fire in the Boot Canyon area. And it probably, would have been, uh, past studies have shown us that um, the fires would have been occurring every 10 to 20 years. So we hadn't had a fire in this area for a very long time, and it was probably just a matter of when, not if. Um, so as Chris mentioned, there were six permanent plots that were surveyed for decades since 1993. Um, the plot locations were chosen to overlap with clusters of plant. And although we gained much information from these plots, such as the lifespan and seed output and all this information, the data collection was not set up to answer this very simple question of just how many plants are out there. Um, and furthermore, besides, you know, Chris taking an opportunity to wander around, there really weren't any formal efforts being made to look for more plants in new places. So the way we went about assessing the population size is we took it in a very regimented way. We defined a sampling universe, and then we went out and put our plots evenly spaced so that we weren't picking where the plots were. We, we decided ahead of time before we got there where we we're going to look for them. The sampling universe is a combination of both the habitat preferences for the species and the um, logistical constraints. So for logistical reasons, we're limited to Big Bend National Park. For habitat preferences, we believe this species is pretty much found only at higher elevations. So we stayed at above 1800 meters. 
And then for logistical reasons, so that we're safe doing our field work, we kept to places where the slope was less than 30 degrees. So we zoom into this patchy bit and where the blue polygon is. That's where the known plants are shown as pink dots. And there's that polygon of the places where the elevation and the slope meet those two criteria. We also looked at vegetation mapping to narrow again our search area to that oak conifer woodland, which is known to be the preferred habitat. And we stayed away from the oak woodland, which isn't really thought to be um, habitat at this point. And so we take all that together and we just focus on the immediate area around where the known plants are as the first step. This is the polygon that we're left with. So I generated a series of plot centers that were 70 meters apart from each other ahead of time before going out to the field. So I don't know what's, what those plots are gonna look like until we actually get there. This is, this is part of the unbiased sampling. So in 2019, Chris and I and um, Maritza Malik from Fish and Wildlife Service and Deb Manley, who's been volunteering with Big Bend National Park for a long time, has been really helpful with this study and, many other vegetation projects in Big Bend National Park. We got these plots done. Some of them, a few of them we ran out of time to get to. And then a couple of them, we also had criteria that we were not going to sample them once we got into the field. For example, if we got there and actually this slope is also really steep, it didn't show up on the map, but this isn't safe. Or one of the plots we had to skip because um, there was a giant boulder in the middle of it. So you can't climb up it. So things like that, but we got most of them done. And using this method, you can see that um, the plots that were near clusters of plants, we found fescue in them, but we also found fescue in two new places that were very far away from the known clusters of plants, and that's where that black arrow is pointing to. Um, so using, the, using this unbiased sampling, we were able to find plants in new places. And here's Chris at one of those plots that were far away where the new plants were found. And I think we had over 90 and it was our, this was as we were hiking down, we were picking up this last one and <laughs> frantically counting the grasses so that we can get off the mountain and be done with the study. So once we have that information, the math is very simple. There's no fancy statistics. All we do is we take all of the plants we found in all of our plots we divide it by the area surveyed in all of our plots and that gives us a plant density. We multiply that density by the entire area of the whole sampling universe, that red polygon, and that gives us the population size. So using the real numbers from our study, we had 267 plants in our plots. We had 3.39 hectares in our, um, all of our plots added together, which gave us a density of 79 plants per hectare multiply that by the area of the sampling units, and we estimated the population size to be 1,826 plants. So great, mission accomplished, let's go home. Then COVID happened, and then there was a fire. <laughs> so the South Rim fire happened in April, 2021. And um, although at this point, we would have really liked to expand our search outside of that red polygon and look in other areas for the fescue, because of this fire, we decided to go back and revisit our plots to see what the effects of the fire were on the population. So this is this is some images of the Boot can Canyon. If you haven't been yet, that the canyon is named after that rock that's sticking up in the left-hand side of those, you know, 2019-2021 pictures, and it sort of looks like a boot upside down. And then on the right, you can also see some of the smoke from that South Rim fire. So as soon as the park opened back up to, it was safe to go out again, Chris and I ran up there in June, 2021 to assess the fire severity. We did that by kind of dividing the forest into three layers, the litter layer, the herbaceous layer, which is the grasses, forbs, and small shrubs, and then the tree canopies. And we ranked each of those layers separately as either low, medium, or high. And then we went out back again in October 21 to actually count the fescue in those plots. This is what it looked like shortly after the fire in that June survey. This was pretty typical of what we were seeing. It was generally a low severity fire. This was best case scenario. Despite all that fuel buildup that I showed you earlier, um, 
you know, th there was the potential for a very explosive, very severe fire because of all those years of fire suppression. And we got very lucky that um, that didn't end up being the case for the most part. So here you can see that on the ground, it's very dark um, because of, there's some char on the ground. And then there's a layer of leaves on top that have freshly fallen that were probably affected by the fire and they've fallen off the trees. Um, you can see that there are already some grasses either re-sprouting or um, they were missed by the fire. And you can also see in the canopies that there's some places where the fire probably got hot enough to kill the leaves, but not the, the flame length was not high enough to actually consume the leaves. And then in other places where the canopies are just fine. Here's an area that got affected a bit more severely. Um, there are places in the foreground where yuccas have been killed, grasses have been killed, but even in this sort of more severe plot, you can see that there are grasses re-sprouting, um, and, and these aren't fescue grasses, they're probably pinion rice, but um, they, they had no problem re-sprouting. Um, and then the same thing in the canopy, some places where the temperatures got hot enough to kill leaves but not consume them. And then, and then just beyond in the background in this picture, you can see canopies that are doing just fine. So to summarize all of our plots together, we found at the litter layer and the canopy layer, it was mostly a low severity fire, just to, like a quick snap. It was very, very um, variable across the landscape as a quick snapshot. And then the herbaceous layer experienced primarily um, equal proportion of low, medium, and high severity. Oh, and I should also mention that 89% of our plot areas were burned. Um, so a little over 10% of the plots weren't even burned. So despite this being a best case scenario and us thinking that this was actually gonna be really beneficial for the grass and clear out some litter and open up some canopy, we lost 60% of the population between our 2019 survey and our 2021 survey. So here you can see on the left-hand side, the 2019 results, we had 267 plants in our plot, which gave us an estimated population size of nearly 2000. And then in 2021, we had less than half of that 113 plants in our plots with a gave us a population size of 772. Um, all the plots that had plants in 2021 also had plants in 2019, so no new plots with plants. Um, but we did lose two plots that had plants in 2019 and didn't have any in 2021. And then um, most of the plots lost. So not only did we lose entire plots of plants, but the plots that did have plants in 2021 had fewer of them. So here you can see that in 2019, three plots had over 60 plants in them. And, but in 2021, none of the plants, none of the plots had over 60 plants in them. Um, we have very small sample sizes. We only had five, one, two, three, four, five, seven, um, seven plants in 2019, and five plots in 2021 that had fescue. This isn't a high enough sample size to do any sophisticated or any statistics really. So I'm just gonna walk you through the, the raw data and show you the sort of patterns that we've been noticing because um, there's still some mysteries with what's going on here. So the only plot to experience an increase in plants was unburned. Three plots experienced the same fire severity, low at um, the litter layer and low at the herbaceous layer, but they had three very different outcomes for how it, the fescue reacted. One plot had over 90 plants in it in 2019 and lost all of them by 2021. But another plot you can see on the right hand side had uh, 64 plants in 2019 and only dropped to 56 in 2021. So even though they experienced the same type of fire, they had really different outcomes in how the fescue reacted. So we thought maybe drought might've been playing a role in this, that maybe if this story is not just as simple as the population size decreases due to fire, maybe there's something else going on. And that's certainly a possibility, although we, again, we don't have the statistics to support it because of this problem with rare plants that there's just not enough of them to do <laughs> statistics with. So in this graph, each colored line is a different year. 
And the year before we did our first survey was 2018, it's blue. And you can see it was actually very good that we have that peak um, here you can see in 2018, so the year before we did very well with rain. And then in 2019, again, it's not, it wasn't great, but it was still pretty good. So maybe when we did our first survey in 2019, the population was doing particularly well. So we had an extra good year. I, this is a story, this is a hypothesis. We don't have the, the results. Um, then the year in, in 2020, the rain was abysmal. It's this purple line down here. So the year in between our first um, survey and our second survey had really low rainfall. So maybe some plants died due just to drought and it had nothing to do with the fire. And that's something we picked up in our 2021 results. Or maybe what happened is they were extra stressed and that made them more susceptible to the effects of fire. Um, thankfully, the year that the wildfire happened in orange year, it was very good rain, very good monsoon rain. So we are hoping that we don't know, but we are hoping that um, the seed bank is going to respond positively to the less litter and we get some good rain and maybe some of these, this population will regenerate. It's, it, it's, a, it's a possible outcome for the situation. So to summarize, our survey methods gave us an unbiased population size estimate. They allowed us to assess um, unplanned fire effects, which was really great benefit of having that pre-fire data. And we lost 57% of the population between 2019 and 2021. So our next steps are to repeat these plot surveys. We're getting ready for going back out again in October. Um, we're also, I convince Chris to stay a couple extra days so we can look in some new places for new plants. And there's also a project that is involving Sol Ross, Karen Little here and here and um, other researchers to grow fescue seeds ex situ and plant them out into the population. And I forgot to put a thank you slide, but there are so many people that were helpful in this and Chris and Norma and Anna and Joe and all the people who helped in the field. What? And Deb, of course, yes. And um, so that, that's my fault for not putting thank you slide, but. <laughs> thank you so much, Carolyn and, and, and Chris. Very informative. Thank you, Ricky. We have time for questions. Um, and I think I'm gonna try to give you the microphone. Hi, Carol, thank you very much. Um, the question is, how well do we know the life cycle of the fescue? I mean, it, does the seeds germinate this following year? Is it lie dormant? We you know almost nothing about the seeds. It'd be great if somebody would like to take that on as a project. Um, we don't know how long they live in the soil, but we certainly hope it's more than a few years because very few of them are reproducing last year when we did our survey. So that's a big mystery about how we're, why we have very little idea about what the trajectory of this population is because we don't know the, the seed dormancy and, or how many seeds there are in the soil. However, I will point out that um, thanks to the original plots that Jackie Poole established and that she and many others worked on, um, they collected this in a 22 year long database of numbers. And I had uh, originally in 2015, I gave that to Norma Fowler and she uh, worked her statistical magic on it. And we were able to answer some questions. Uh, we know that this is a short lived perennial species, although a very small number of individuals survived throughout that 22 year period. The average lifespan was something like 3.6 years. And um, mortality is, uh, is considerably higher in the year following a year when a plant reproduced. So they'll live vegetatively a few years and then they get enough energy and they flower. And that uses up so, much, so many resources that, um, a lot of them die. So a lot of the plants only reproduce once if they reproduce at all. I also wanted to point out a couple of things. One is that the decrease in population size 
that we saw after the fire, you know, after a year of drought and fire, was about the same amount of decline that we saw after previous droughts. So I want to underscore that we're at what Carolyn did say is that we're not sure why the population declined. Is it the fire or the drought or both? The other thing is that um, although this was not a prescribed fire, it happened, but we were very lucky that it happened in April. Well, we, yeah, throughout the American West, we understand that it is no longer acceptable to ask, you know, uh, if an area should burn. All of these, you know, pine forests and pine oak forests are going to burn sooner or later. It's inevitable. And we were very lucky that this spontaneous wildfire occurred at a real favorable period of the year when I think there had been some rainfall before that and it was relatively cool. If this same fire had occurred a few months later, it would have torched all of Boot Canyon. You would have seen, um, you know, complete uh, crown, you know, canopy fires and, and uh, a complete stand replacement. So, um, you know, we have this issue in plant conservation where we might think, well, should we take this action, such as a prescribed burn that may kill individuals, you know, shouldn't we do no harm? But if we are so timid that we fail to take that action, the entire population will gradually decline. But maybe that's the guiltless, you know, way. It's like, well, we didn't do anything, it just happened. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Carolyn? You referred to the seed bank. Is that just the natural seeds that are on the ground or is that a formal bank where seeds are retained? Uh, that's a great question because it's both. <laughs> and in this case, I was referring to the natural seeds that are in the soil that will germinate when the conditions are right. But then uh, that's a great question because seed bank is also used for the places where seeds are frozen and stored. Um, so, but in this case, I wasn't referring to that. At, at what point will you decide to characterize the Guadalupe fescue either endangered, threatened, or will you apply for that characterization? Oh, but um, I think we're supposed to repeat the questions, right? Uh, oh, oh they have the, okay. But I didn't quite understand that. Can well, you, uh, you started your lecture as uh, characterizing endangered, threatened, and so on. And you're doing this study to characterize these plants. So you've had a series of studies. At what point will you decide either to abandon it, it's not threatened, it's not endangered, or to proceed with it with further studies? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And um, the, the, the official answer to that is that uh, when we list a species as threatened or endangered, we must prepare a recovery plan. And the recovery plan establishes criteria that uh, we would like to meet. If the, if the species reaches these criteria, then we can either downlist or reclassify to threatened or delist. And actually, uh, Right, it is endangered. We published, uh, I actually prepared the recovery plan uh, in 2020. 20, 20, 20. It was published uh, a year ago as a proposed plan. We received comments back on it. And then that, the final plan was published uh, in July, I think of this year. So um, you can download that right off the internet and you can see exact, you know, what those uh, criteria are. But uh, the plan involves uh, con conserving not just the US population, but working with Mexican uh, agencies and institutions to protect the Mexican populations also. So that's kind of interesting because we don't have authority to do anything in Mexico, but uh, we're fortunate that we have some very willing partners on the Mexican side that are working with us. Well, thank you so much.